Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session, Race and Housing, Practical Approaches to Inequity. This session will be an hour long. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A. Um, I will be, oh, sorry, I'm Carol Nelson with the Utah's Office of Homeless Services. I will be monitoring the Q&A to answer any logistical questions that come up. Questions for presenters will be answered time permitting. So to start things off, uh, Maya Reyna will be moderating this panel. Maya has worked in homeless services for over six years, spending time at the Road Home and now currently at Housing Connect. She has worked with both families and individuals to help households transition from homelessness to housing, support clients to gain greater access to services and benefits, and assist households in establishing stability. Maya has a vast understanding of barriers marginalized populations encounter with housing stability and, uh, and why long-term stable housing is crucial for individual success. Take it away, Maya. Awesome, thanks, Carol, um, for that introduction. And for all of you guys for joining us here today, um, before we get started, I did wanna introduce our panelists. Unfortunately, Heather was not able to join us today, but we do have Joel Aviso Savala, who currently serves as a curriculum specialist and researcher at the Utah Division of Multicultural Affairs. And we also have Nick Jackson, who is currently a supervising attorney at the Disability Law Center, where he focuses on fair housing issues. Um, before working at the Disability Law Center, Nick did work as a homeless youth outreach worker as well. So thank you both for being here and for being willing to um, have this discussion with us. Um, to get started, I imagine you guys have all joined this session because you're concerned um, and as we all are concerned about how to house the most vulnerable among us. Um, and this is an important topic because it clearly impacts those that we're serving. So this panel was created to firstly talk about fair housing and how it systemically impacts people of color um, and marginalized populations. Um, as was mentioned by our keynote speaker this morning, 40% of the population nationwide experiencing homelessness are Afri African American, but they only account for 13% of the nation's population overall. So this is a real issue. Um, and the only way for us to combat the issue is to talk about it. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, but we also hope that you guys can um, get some tools and some resources to take back to your respective agencies to help you guys better understand fair housing um, and how it applies to what you do and then what you can do to further establish racial equity in your communities and for those that you work with. So we're going to go ahead and get started and we're going to start first and foremost by talking about what fair housing is exactly. So. Um, Nick and Howell, this first question is for both of you. Feel free to answer in whatever order you choose. Um, but what is fair housing and why is it important to people of color? Um, so I can I can jump in on that one first, although I, I do want to hear Howell's thoughts as well. Um, from a, a legal perspective, fair housing is you know, a, a somewhat narrow set of laws, and in fact, it's mostly just the Federal Fair Housing Act and the State Fair Housing Act. And those, you know, in, in large part, um, prohibit discrimination against a person in any kind of housing related transaction um, on the basis of a protected class, um, race, color, national origin, gender, disability, religion, and family status, which is just having kids or planning on having kids. Um, and then there are a few other protections in Utah as well. Landlords um, can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, or source of income, uh, which means having a, a housing voucher or housing subsidy of some kind. So that's kind of the, the really narrow legal definition of fair housing, but the idea of fair housing is really a lot broader. Um, and I'll mention later, some of the promises and some of the failures of the Fair Housing Act. Um, but I think, you know, fair housing has the potential to reach kind of all aspects of, of how people live, which really means, you know, really deep into the way we live as a society and the way, you know, we treat people in that society. Yeah, and I would say from my perspective, um, as a researcher, 
you know, fair housing is about looking at data systems and data sets to see who is getting access to resources and services. Um, you know, ensuring that individuals are successfully housed means looking at their success long term and not just in the short term. Um, fair housing is also about the quality of the residents, uh, the neighborhoods and the communities where individuals are living. Um, and ensuring that people have access to the resources that they need to maintain their housing um, and be successful in being housed long term. Uh, so that's kind of how I look at housing and fair housing from the research perspective. And, and I think that's a good point. I actually wanted to jump back in there um, and just kind of tie, you know, what you said about housing quality and and what a person's housing is like. Um, you know, I. I've been out of the direct homeless services world for a little while, but I believe that housing first is still, um, you know, a really predominant model in terms of thinking about what people that that don't have a home need kind of to 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 get to a better place. Um, and I think that kind of recognizes that housing is so important, you know, where you live um, determines the quality of your housing. Um, the, the schools that your kids will go to, the environmental pollutants that, that you might be exposed to, you know, if you're going to have to commute or not, and what that's going to look like, what kind of jobs are available, if your church will be nearby, um, who your friends will be. Um, there was a study that came out a little while ago that found that um, your zip code is more determinative of your health than your genetic code. Um, which is which is pretty striking, you know, where you live really um, impacts kind of all other parts of a person's life. And so I guess that's the answer to the second part of, of your question, Maya, is, you know, it's really kind of a core um, civil right and a core part of, of, you know, all of our experience. Awesome. I'm glad you looped that in because I was hoping someone would tackle that second part of that question. Um, but it also leads to the next question, which Hoel, I wanted to ask you specifically. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to why historical context is so important when, it talk, when talking about racial equity in housing? Absolutely. When we look at um, fair housing across communities of color in the United States, communities of color really haven't ever systemically had access to fair housing, right, on a larger level. Um, historically speaking, you know, we know that communities of color predominantly live in um, neighborhoods that are structurally vulnerable. Um, and what we mean by structural vulnerability is that lack of resources and lack of infrastructure that makes the neighborhood truly livable, right? Um, access to quality, you know, services and streets and resources, stores, schools, and et cetera. Uh, and so when we look at urban housing specifically, we know that communities of color are predominantly concentrated in areas that are very structurally vulnerable in terms of their neighborhoods. Um, when we look outside of urban areas and rural settings, we know that indigenous communities and indigenous na nations are also historically um, have been in structurally vulnerable areas in rural settings where um, in many cases there is a complete lack of infrastructure, uh, you know, access to clean water, running water even. Uh, utilities, services, and et cetera, uh, roads, for example. Um, and so that leaves communities and their housing, you know, in a very, in, in a very structurally vulnerable sort of way um, or place. Uh, and then when we look at African-American communities in the United States, you know, historically redlining practices, you know, um, have gentrified neighborhoods um, over time, you know, increasingly so, and African-American communities and African-American individuals, you know, were not allowed to, uh, were not given access to loans and quality housing, and if they were, then the loans were substandard, um, and that redlining practice, which separated Black neighborhoods from predominantly white neighborhoods, um, ended up uh, giving many African-American families and individuals subpar loans, or subprime loans is what they refer to, and so across communities of color in urban settings, rural settings, um, you know, we see housing inequity across the board. Uh, and that's something that has not only been historical, but we see the ramifications of it today. Uh, reservation communities, urban communities, and things like that are still in existence. And we still see a lot of communities of color struggling to access, uh, struggling to access, uh, you know, good housing. Yeah, great, thank you. And I was just thinking while you're talking more about that generational wealth piece, if you can't afford a loan, you don't have that mm -hmm. um, uh, equity in your home to pass on and therefore you're a little bit um, behind in that, in that way too. So Absolutely. thank you for speaking to that. 
Um, Nick, I want to jump to you and talk more about kind of fair housing issues that you may have seen in, in the Disability Law Center. What are some things that you've seen surrounding fair housing and the issues um, that come up with people of color? Yeah, um, so I guess I want to split my answer a little bit into kind of issues facing individual people that, that come to our office and then some of the larger systemic issues that we, we see and try to, try to address. Um, and I guess really quickly, so we um, we're called the Disability Law Center. We're what's called a protection and advocacy agency. So we mostly work um, to protect and preserve the civil rights of people with disabilities in Utah. Um, in terms of fair housing, we um, have a grant from HUD and we provide um, fair housing advice and legal representation to anybody, not just people with disabilities. So anybody facing possible discrimination on any of those bases that I that I raised earlier. Um, so we see, um, I mean, we tend to see the whole gamut of of discriminatory conduct by by landlords. Unfortunately, um, probably the most common issues that that we see that affect people of color that that come to our office looking for advice. Um, are either discriminatory terms and conditions, which is what the statute says, and it basically just means that the landlord is treating them differently um, than, than other people uh, on the basis of their race or color or national origin. Um, and that often is, um, means something like uh, requiring a higher credit score um, of a black applicant, perhaps, than, than of white applicants, or um, coming down more harshly on some kind of lease violation or alleged lease violation um, uh, on a person of color than, than the landlord would on a white tenant, things like that. Um, and then we also see um, discriminatory refusals to rent um, or to negotiate for rental. And that is, you know, at the beginning, um, that's before the person even has a chance to to get the apartment. They're kind of already turned down um, for the apartment or kind of rejected from the possibility of even trying to to work with the landlord to talk about, you know, what the terms of a lease might be um, or something like that. In contrast to, um, I think, you know, a lot of people when they think of discrimination, especially housing discrimination, they think of um, kind of older, um, more explicit forms of discrimination that we don't see as much these days as we used to, you know, signs in the window saying that certain classes of people need not apply. Um, that, while it does happen um, occasionally, we generally see um, what we sometimes call discrimination with a smile. Um, and that uh, is discriminatory conduct by a landlord that, um, you know, is accompanied by a kind of an, oh, geez, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, good luck, good luck on your apartment search. Um, those kind of things where oftentimes the, um, the applicant might not even really know that they've been discriminated against in, in a typical um, situation because, you know, say, um, a person of color calls a landlord and that landlord might say, oh, you know, thanks for your interest, but that apartment was just rented. I'm really sorry, but, you know, good luck. Um, try again next time. And, you know, the person would hang up um, by themselves. They wouldn't necessarily know that anything was amiss or that they had been lied to and, or, or had the availability of the apartment misrepresented. Um, so one of the things we do on a um, non-client based level um, is we run um, a, a fair housing testing program. Um, and we use that to try to uncover some of this um, somewhat hidden discrimination, this discrimination with a smile. And it's kind of like a secret shopper program. So the idea is you take two people, both of which are equally qualified for an apartment. You know, they both have a, have a job and, and a, a wage that makes it so that they can afford the apartment and they don't have a, you know, a disqualifying criminal record, or all the things, you know, they have kind of an equal um, application packet and they should be treated equally by, by an objective non-discriminatory landlord. Um, we set these up so that 
Um, they share all of the same characteristics and qualifications except for one. And that's the thing that, that we're testing for. So um, for instance, we might send two testers out, both equally qualified. One is Hispanic and sounds Hispanic on the phone, has a Hispanic, has a Hispanic name. Um, and then the other one uh, is a white tenant and we monitor how the landlord treats each of those tenants and you know in a in a non-discriminatory interaction those tenants should receive roughly equal treatment from the landlord they should be quoted the same price they should both be invited to look at the apartment if it's vacant they should be given consistent information um, and unfortunately oftentimes they're not um, national origin is a is a, um, one of the ways that we find the most common instances of discrimination um, in that regard. And um, we can use this testing program to um, kind of shine a light on some of the discrimination that otherwise would just be kind of a barrier to a person finding housing that they wouldn't even be in a position to address because of the way that the discrimination occurs. Thanks. And also, can you speak maybe can your expertise speak really quickly to the intersectionality that people might experience when it comes to fair housing um, based on those other classes that you mentioned, like sexual orientation and things like that? Sure. Um, yeah, and I think that that's intersectionality is a really important concept. Um, and for anybody that doesn't know, well, I think there, there are probably some different conceptions of intersectionality. Um, but I think it's a, a, a relative, well, it's not even relatively recent. I think it's intersectionality is kind of an analytical framework to try to recognize that humans are really complicated social creatures um, and that an explanation of somebody's experience that relies on one axis of social identity is not going to tell the complete story. So what I mean is that you can't explain everything that happens in society or the interactions between a landlord and a tenant um, strictly by looking at the race of people involved um, or by looking at the gender of people involved or, or something like that. Humans, um, you know, are, are complicated um, and uh, kind of on a, on a practical level, looking at the way that um, people's social identities intersect um, and might present um, uh, barriers or opportunities um, in a way that that they wouldn't for another person, I think is really important because, you know, as service providers, we want to um, kind of be in a place to, to identify and address the needs of our clients. Um, and so looking um, at um, different social identities that might present um, present barriers is is important. And oftentimes, you know, I think that um, intersectionality, um, somebody with two overlapping um, identities um, might be in a position that's kind of more of the sum of their parts, if, if that makes sense. Um, you know, intersectionality is um, really looks different for um, for everybody, and I think that's kind of one of one of the points. And so, um, you know, in our work, we see a lot of instances where people do have um, an issue that that can be addressed in an intersectional kind of way. Um, one example that comes to mind that we saw recently uh, was a, a black tenant with mental illness um, who is engaging in some behaviors due to their mental illness. Um, and the landlord treated them in a way that the evidence kind of, I think, shows that the landlord would not have treated a, a Black person without mental illness um, in the way that they treated this person, and they probably wouldn't have treated a white person with mental illness in this way either. You know, this, this tenant received treatment, um, discriminatory treatment, um, that was kind of compounded based on um, the you know, the, their race and their disability in a way that wouldn't have been present otherwise, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. It's really important to talk about intersectionality because like you said, it 
we're all at different places in our life, but we all have these um, these marks, these identifiers to us that like are important in terms of like our overall success mm -hmm. um, and equity. So um, thanks for answering that question. I appreciate that expertise and that insight. Um, Hoel, question for you. Um, where do you see service providers falling short when it comes to serving people of color or marginalized populations in general? So I really appreciate this question on all levels. Um, I had the opportunity for almost two years uh, to serve as a case manager, um, worked with individuals in a substance use treatment center, um, and then oftentimes was directly involved in their search for housing. Um, you know, we had various um, housing programs and housing opportunities that we sort of provided to our clients um, as they progressed through their substance abuse treatment. And so I really got to see through that experience, um, not only intersectionality with various identities and, and life experiences, um, but also a lot of holes or gaps in, um, in our practices and services. Um, so with that being said, you know, I think there's two that are really important for us to consider and uh, changing. Number one is when we work with clients of color, you know, we it's okay for us and it's actually recommended, I would recommend that we understand that our clients of color are going to face unique difficulties that other clients um, are not going to face in their search for housing. Um, as Nick mentioned, you know, there are discriminatory practices out there that are still in existence that impact individuals um, as well as communities as a whole. Um, when I was a case manager, you know, I understood that all of our clients, regardless of their life experience, deserve access to the full spectrum of resources and opportunities. And so this isn't about allocating more resources to one group or one person over another, but rather it's about changing our mindset about how those resources are utilized. So when I worked with clients of color, you know, and for me as a person of color, um, oftentimes, you know, the clients of color that I worked with were very candid and open with me about potential racial, ethnic, cultural discrimination that they've received in the past. Um, they had a lot of inquiries and questions and curiosities around why they were treated so unfairly. And um, oftentimes, you know, with some of our white clients that we worked with, they would even see the differences in experiences or at least question whether or not there were differences in experiences and whether or not those experiences were related to the color of their skin and their race. And so I think as case managers, it's really important for us to be racially conscious. You know, we want to understand that, or we should understand that, you know, there's going to be these additional barriers. And so in addition to just access to housing resources, we also need to ensure that our clients um, understand that systemically speaking, um, it may be working against them. And so it's really a case manager's opportunity to help uh, clients of color navigate the system more effectively. Just because we provide access to resources doesn't mean that the client is going to receive those resources in the way that they were intended. And so having that racial lens and that racial consciousness is very, very important to helping a client navigate an inherently racist system. Um, and so that's um, the first thing that comes to mind. I think, um, you know, where do we as service providers fall short sometimes? I think, um, I think sometimes we fall short uh, in regards to having a long term perspective on what housing means. Uh, you know, going back to what you mentioned earlier, Maya, you know, redlining practices prevented, um, you know, African American communities and even other communities of color from accessing, you know, um, homes. And thus the generational wealth, you know, uh, gap in the generational wealth was not created and maintained in the way that it was for white communities. And so as a result, you know, when African-American clients or other clients of color go out into the housing market, whether they're looking for a home to purchase or looking to rent, um, we really should be providing them resources and opportunities and services that are gonna help build their wealth over time. Um, and so really thinking critically about, you know, um, typically when we work with clients who are experiencing homelessness, you know, it usually is not a direct path from homeless, uh, the experiences of homelessness to home ownership, right? There's usually a lot of steps in between. But I think as case managers, we could say, you know, we want to plant the seeds of hope and opportunity. And we want to tell our clients of color in particular that the goal is home ownership. We want you to get there. Um, we want to provide resources and opportunities for you to get there. Here's what it looks like, right? And share those resources and that information and that knowledge freely. Um, and having historical understanding that redlining and other housing practices over time have uh, caused inequity for communities of color, I think helps us do that. 
Um, so to quickly recap, you know, let us be racially conscious in this work. Um, we need to help clients of color navigate inherently racist systems, and that includes how that includes our housing systems. And then second is let's also think about the long-term vision for this. We want people to build wealth and, and uh, reduce debt over time so that they can be more self-sufficient. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be more resources allocated and more services really allocated from case managers uh, to support those clients in that long-term effort. I love it. I love that response. That was wonderful, especially the long-term part of like home ownership. I think we, um, oftentimes just get so much in the crisis mode that we forget to think long-term, um, which kind of leads me into my next question, which I would like your insight on this as well, Howell, is for those of us who are doing direct services, the boots on the ground folks, the ones who are making direct contact every single day, how do we start holding landlords accountable to, the, to this fair housing? Um, and Nick, I would love to hear your perspective from the legal side too, but let's start with you, Howell. What do you think? Yeah, I think accountability is incredibly difficult, right? Um, I think accountability best happens um, when we have uh, thoughtful relationships with the individuals that we're working with. Um, when I was a case manager, uh, look, uh, help supporting individuals uh, through substance abuse treatment, as well as access to housing and, and legal services. Um, one of the things that was really in, uh, important to our practice was our relationship with Housing Connect, for example, and other housing agencies so that we could um, really have that accountability piece in place through the relationships that we have. But I think holding landlords accountable for fair housing, I think that requires and necessitates partnership. It requires a lot of individuals. No, sing no single case manager can hold any single landlord or group of landlords accountable for fair housing. It requires the organizations that we work with to back up and support case managers who are navigating difficult housing systems. Um, it requires those partnerships to then be very um, thoughtful and proactive um, in having discussions that are uncomfortable and difficult when we um, get the sense that fair housing practices and laws are not being followed. Um, and it also requires, you know, transparency. Um, organizations should be incredibly transparent um, with landlords about their concerns um, and about, you know, why aren't they renting to, you know, our, you know, our clients, right? Why is there this gap? What is happening here? So I think accountability happens through partnerships, organizational level partnerships. It happens through relationships, but most importantly, it happens through having difficult conversations, right? And not shying away from those conversations. Um, but it can be very scary, you know, for case managers who are invested and interested in racial equity in their practice. Um, you know, the best recommendation that I can give to you is find other case managers who are willing to do the work alongside you so that you're functioning as a team. Um, never go at this alone because it is a difficult system to navigate for anyone. Um, but do it as a team. Find individuals who are committed to your efforts in similar ways um, so that you can hold folks accountable. Yeah, and I think that was that was a great answer. And, um, I'm not sure that I have a, a ton to add, um, other than you know there are some um, some legal options available. It is definitely um, difficult, as Hoel said, um, to to hold landlords accountable, um, especially when looking at it um, on kind of an individual level or that level in the moment when you have a person that you're trying to help find housing. Um, or you're a person looking for housing, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of barriers in, in the way of holding landlords accountable. Um, you know, Utah, the laws that surround evictions um, in Utah, which give, you know, kind of no mercy to, to the tenant, as I'm sure many of the people here, um, you know, are aware. Um, the it can be difficult, you know, from, um, you know, there's a, a power imbalance with a tenant and a landlord, and that's true even when the tenant has a caseworker. And, um, you know, I really like uh, that idea about, about partnerships. Um, I think that that is, is really crucial in, in being able to kind of address this, this multi-headed um, multi problem. On the more practical um, legal side, um, you know, there are, I, I do think, you know, to the extent somebody is having um, a, a legal issue, 
um, and there's some um, free legal services available. I think talking to an attorney sooner rather than later can be good um, if somebody's facing eviction or something like that, because um, landlords will be talking to their attorneys, to you know, to to their Kirk Colomore or whoever else, um, and. There are not nearly enough free legal services to go around, but there are some, um, and there are some around housing. Um, both Utah Legal Services and People's Legal Aid provide um, legal representation to people facing evictions. Um, and people, either the, the tenants or the home seekers or the caseworker, um, are always welcome to call our office um, if they think that there might be some kind of discriminatory issue um, filing a fair housing complaint is one of the few areas of law where it's actually easy to file a civil rights complaint. Um, you know, there are usually a lot of hoops um, or you need to hire an attorney or something uh, that you can file, anybody can file a fair housing complaint and there's a process set up um, where either the state or the federal government, um, you know, investigates fair housing allegations. Um, and like I said, the Disability Law Center is, is available too to talk, um, to talk out situations if people think, you know, there's that a landlord might be discriminating um, or might be about to discriminate. We can definitely talk and, and have options. I'm always welcome to, to take those kind of phone calls. Awesome, that's, that's great to know. Um, kind of want to bring it back to there's been a lot of talk about affordable housing, which is clearly unnecessary in society. Um, but for those folks who are already housed, so we talked about kind of like the crisis management where we're trying to get folks into housing. But what about those folks that are already housed? Like what can case managers or other organizations do to um, help facilitate better support fair housing um, and help landlords kind of do better at fair housing? What would that collaboration look like if that's a possibility? That's a great question. I think um, in my experience, especially when I was doing active case management, um, my experience uh, at that level was there were a lot of landlords who were interested in supporting people and helping individuals, right? Um, and I think, you know, finding those individuals and working with them directly and maintaining those relationships, you know, is one way that you can, you know, work with landlords, right? Um, we, we don't want to make our jobs harder than they have to be. Case management and homeless services is um, one of the most difficult things that we can, uh, inter and from my perspective, um, it, for me, I'll just, I'll be a little bit more transparent. For me, it was one of the most difficult jobs that I ever had. Um, it was incredibly rewarding when things went well, but it was really, really hard. Um, very, very difficult work. Um, and with that being said, you know, how can we work with landlords for, to better support fair housing? I think, I think it really comes down to ensuring people and landlords know why they're in the business in the first place. Asking landlords, why do you do this? right, what is your end goal? And figuring out why they are part of the system and why they are doing what they're doing. Uh, I think we don't always have conversations with landlords about why they actually do what they do because not every landlord does, does, does is in it for the same reason, right? Um, and so I think figuring out why they're there um, and finding those that have empathy, compassion, as well as a business mindset is really important. Nick, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I think that that's, that's really hard too. Um, I, you know, we, we also struggle with that. I think one of the hardest things that we ever deal with is that situation where somebody's in, in housing um, already and, you know, it's, it's a complicated situation for one reason or another. And it's just, you know, it's really hard to um, you know, make sure that the tenant has resources, that the landlord's legitimate concerns are addressed, that there aren't any illegitimate concerns on the landlord's part, um, you know, that, that the tenants know their legal rights. Um, there, um, there's an article in the Salt Lake Tribune today or yesterday about the use of three-day notices to, to kind of harass or, or intimidate um, renters um, which is, which is a really interesting article. Um, 
you know, and I think those those situations are 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 difficult in large part um, because the landlords generally are the ones that are, you know, that have the power um, in that situation and they can do things like issue three day notices, um, which makes it hard for a tenant and a caseworker with a million other, you know, clients that they're working with to scramble to figure out solutions to complex issues within three days, you know, or, or else the eviction process gets started. Um, so I think one one big thing that can be done, you know, on the on the legal side, at the risk of sounding like a hammer looking for a nail, is is you know tenants knowing their rights, caseworkers knowing what rights their tenants have, because um, landlords um, kind of hold the cards, and and it can be especially difficult to work on things like keeping a job, making payments on time, you know dealing with other kind of complex issues when you're looking down the barrel of a gun um, because of the three day notices. So, you know, being able to know what rights the tenant has on their side so that they can, I guess, firmly, but reasonably work with the landlord, you know, in a way where both sides have at least something approaching some equal bargaining power. Cool. And then I have a follow-up question to that. Where can folks go to find out what their rights are? You've mentioned a couple of places, but are, are there any other places people can go to get that information and that's legal support? Um, so there, there are definitely some, some good resources. Utah Legal Services, um, like I said, um, and People's Legal Aid both provide representation and advice in specific cases. Utah Legal Services has a bunch of really helpful Utah specific information on their website, you know, so my landlord didn't give me back my security deposit. What can I do about that? Or I got this notice that says I need to leave in five days. Is that is that valid? What could I do? Um, similarly, uh, the Utah Courts Self Help Center. Um, uh, has a lot of good online information and forms people can use if they're to that point where they're dealing with legal issues with their with their landlord. Um, our office also provides um, fair housing trainings on a regular basis. We have one coming up, um, kind of on the the nitty gritty of of the Fair Housing Act. You know who is covered, what types of conduct is prohibited, those kind of things. Um, we have one coming up, I think, next week. Um, I think, though, that to be honest, that kind of tenant, um, also people looking for homes, but especially people in that kind of especially vulnerable spot of, of renting, um, I think that we could use a lot more kind of tenant education and cooperation and and unity to um, to make sure that you know people do have opportunities to to learn about those things. I think the, the word that I keep hearing that I really like is partnership. Um, that's what we do, right? As case managers and as service providers, we're in it to, with our client and we're in it with landlords to make this work. So that's kind of what I keep hearing every occurring theme. And so I, I wanted to hit that before we move on to the next question. Um, Howell, this is a two-part question for you. Um, how do we as service providers identify our biases? Um, and then I think, we can all relate to the fact that change is super hard and that acknowledging that like we have biases can be really uncomfortable and lead to a lot of discomfort, which can then make us want to not change, change be even harder, right? So the second part of the question is, how can we then lean into the discomfort of identifying our biases and turn that into positive change? Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate this question, these set of questions on so many levels. Um, let's go ahead and start really at that individual place, right? We know, we can know our biases if we really, really pay attention to how we um, are responding to the experiences around us and the people around us, right? Um, and that means sort of understanding uh, just kind of like our initial anxieties, discomforts around new experiences or new people, it could be um, maybe our defensiveness. It could be um, our desire to 
not want to support someone um, are sometimes we find biases because we're labeling someone something before we actually know who they are or what is going on for them and what their needs are or what strengths they might have as a human being as well. And so biases and bias mitigation, uh, first and foremost, at the individual level is really just about knowing like who you are as a person. Um, you know, for me, um, I do racial equity work. You know, that's a core component to a lot of the work that I do. Um, and there are times when people ask me very, very difficult questions. And I know that my bias is creeping up because sometimes when those questions are difficult enough, um, I don't want to answer them, right? Um, and the reason I don't want to answer, answer them is because I get the sense that that question is coming from a place of, um, you know, racism um, or some form, other form of supremacy. Um, however, you know, in my work, you know, I can sort of say, oh, I'm having a reaction uh, to this question. I'm having a reaction to this person, I'm having a reaction to this experience. And then the goal is, why am I having this reaction? Where is this coming from? Um, am I potentially biased? And the answer is pretty much always yes, all of us are biased. So how do we lean into this comfort? Just assume that you're biased. It's really that simple. We just need to assume that we're biased. All of us have biases. And the more that we just lean in and say, you know what, human beings are inherently biased, the more that we can sort of accept that and just say, you know what, this is part of my experience. It's normal for me to be biased. Then we can start doing the difficult work of uncovering them and then not using them to cause harm or prevent people from accessing to resources. Accessing resources. Um, so with that being said, you know, let me get a little bit more tangible here. Um, how do service providers identify the biases? Look, look inward, figure out what your body is reacting to. If you're interacting with a black client who may also be struggling with substance use disorder or uh, may have some uh, mental health issues that are going on at the same time and you feel unsafe or uncomfortable, um, you're probably carrying some biases there. Because if we're case managers and we're working with these individuals who are structurally vulnerable, at the end of the day, you're the case manager who has the power in the room. You're the one with the power, not the client, right? And so if you feel afraid, there is no structural reason for your fear, right? It's really more of an individual sort of culture one where we've become accustomed to fearing something that's different um, from what we're used to. So I really, I like to share that with folks, right? Um, and I think that's important. And then uh, something a little bit more tangible as far as the discomfort is concerned, just allow yourself to be uncomfortable. Um, you know, sometimes when we are case managing individuals and we see the same problem coming back over and over again, because that happens for us as case managers, right? Or those of us who have been case managers, you know, we feel like we've provided every single resource and every single opportunity for a client, you know, to get housed or get access to this service and something just isn't clicking. Um, but just remember, every single time that that happens, you have an opportunity to try again. That's our jobs, right? And so it may be uncomfortable and it may be difficult, um, but just prepare for it and spend some time, you know, usually when I had case management sessions, I would schedule five minutes in between my sessions just so that I could decompress, reset, and be available for my clients, right? And that five minutes can make a huge difference in just sort of touching in with with ourselves, figuring out where we're uncomfortable and decide what we're gonna do with it. And typically the best answer is to learn from it, right? And to grow from it. So those are my thoughts. I love it. I really appreciate that insight. Um, the next question is for both of you guys. Um, why do we need to keep having these conversations? Personally, when I've broached the topic of inequity, the response I've all often encountered is like, why should I feel bad for something my ancestors did? Like, I didn't create this problem. It's been here for a long time or things are fine. Like we have affirmative action that's balancing things out. Um, and then sometimes people are made to feel guilty. Um, but I think the point of these conversations, and I think the point of these conversations is not to make people feel guilty because like that's not gonna change behavior, right? But the problem, the problem is real. I mean, referencing the statistic from the keynote speaker this morning and then just some statistics for Salt Lake City alone in 2018, 2019, 
2% of the population was African Americans in the state of Utah, but they made up 13% of Salt Lake City's shelter population. So this shows us that whatever we're doing or not doing is clearly not working. So we need to keep having these conversations. And I'd like to hear your thoughts from the both of you guys, um, kind of speaking it to why you to have that conversation um, and why it's continually important to keep talking about these issues. And I, I like that point about the, the kind of um, the defensive position that, that some people often have, like, why should I feel guilty? Or, you know, I've heard, um, you know, people characterize um, critical race theory as saying that it's there to make, you know, white people feel bad for, for something their ancestors done, you know, quote, did, quote unquote. Um, and I think that that's really just kind of missing, missing the point. You know, it's not, one, it's not about those people. Um, and two, it's, you know, it's not about guilt, like you said, um, that's not going to, that's not going to do anything for anybody, um, somebody feeling guilty, rightly or wrongly. Um, you know, another thing that I, that I've heard a lot of people fall back into, in addition to that, why should I feel guilty thing is, um, kind of the idea that that racism is is somehow is gone now or has been solved or or something like that which is you know obviously not the case with things like um, you know things that we see in our work every day as exemplified by that statistic um, you just mentioned Maya um, you know it's 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 not gone um, we you know the problem has has not been solved and in fact we are, as residentially segregated today as we were in 1968. And that's when the Fair Housing Act was passed. Um, and it was, the Fair Housing Act was very hard fought for. Um, beginning of, of the civil rights era, you know, in the 40s, 50s, there were many attempts at a housing discrimination law and it was kind of just like a third rail at the time. It was just not gonna happen. There was too much um, opposition um, to, um, to allow a national, you know, housing discrimination law to go into effect. And it took um, the, the riots that were occurring after the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, the riots that were in Washington, D.C., you know, in view of the Capitol that finally kind of created enough urgency and, and political capital to, for, for lawmakers to be able to act, finally passed the Fair Housing Act um, and in a lot of ways, it really is is an unfilled, um, an unfilled promise. Like I said, you know, seg residential segregation is is the same as it was in 1968. Um, I just wanted to share a couple maps that that are good at, at kind of exemplifying. You know, people think that just straight up segregation is is some kind of a thing of the past. Um, these maps, I think, do a good job of, of showing that that's not the case. Um, so this is a, they're called dot density maps. This is a dot density map of New York City. Um, each dot represents one person and the dots are color coded by race. Um, and residential patterns of segregation and historical patterns of segregation that, are, that persist from the days of redlining um, and restrictive covenants and all those things, you know, still really exist in force. Um, and I think, you know, if, if anybody is from New York or has spent a significant amount of time in New York, I bet that you can look at this map and tell me what race each color stands for um, without seeing the legend. You know, that's, that's how ingrained, um, ingrained some of these um, historical patterns of segregation are. Um, and I wanted to also, so that was New York City. I also wanted to just really quickly show um, Salt Lake um, and Ogden. Um, and again, I think people can probably look at this map um, and tell that the blue dots um, are white people um, and that the orange dots are Hispanic people and that the red dots are Asian people. Um, because we see these, you know, we see historical patterns of segregation that persist today, every day. 
Um, these are these are not things that are gone or, or somehow no longer visible. Um, you know, so I think one one of the biggest and at the risk of stating the obvious, one of the biggest reasons we need to keep having this conversation um, is because these problems persist. You know, there are there are serious inequities in housing and in other areas um, that we simply, you know, that are that persist um, and you know need 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 to be addressed. And then this final one, um, just in case uh, for the Ogden people, this is the the dot density map of of Ogden with that same legend. Yeah, thank you for that, Nick. Um, I'll go ahead and add from kind of the the individual uh, human kind of perspective, which is, you know, we have to keep having these conversations because individuals and systems, for some reason, and or for many reasons, are just unwilling to change. Um, we don't have to have the same conversations if change has happened, or if accountability has happened, or if equity, you know, is happening or has happened. Um, and so ultimately, you know, for those of us who do this work on this side of the work, those of us who do racial equity work or any form of equity work, you know, on our end of things, I know for me, I'm constantly thinking of new ways to have the conversation. I'm constantly thinking of different approaches, uh, different methods, um, different ways of teaching, different ways of building partnership, different ways of relating to individuals who may be different than me. Um, and at the same time, that is really exhausting, right? Um, part of why I choose to have this conversation over and over again or have this be a part of my work is because, yes, I do care deeply about it, but it would be really wonderful if we didn't have to have the conversation, if people just said, you know what, I think it's time for us to change. I think everyone deserves access to equitable housing. I don't want to live in a neighborhood that is racially segregated. I would love to live in a place where my children or my family members or my loved ones and friends where we can interact and learn from different human beings. But ultimately, you know, folks have to make those decisions and then the systems that we operate within have to make those decisions as well. Um, I think another thing as far as these conversations is concerned it, that I think is important is at the end of the day, I think it, what I would like from folks that I work with um, or what I would like to see from housing specialists, case managers and et cetera, is a willingness to be to sit in, in the discomfort more often going back to what you shared earlier maya you know some individuals feel guilty when they learn about inequity or historical inequity and for anyone who's familiar with dr Brene brown and her work you know her work has been incredibly transformative for my life as well and one of the things that she mentioned early on her earlier on in her kind of public career was that guilt is actually a really functional feeling for us as humans. Um, she says it a little bit differently, but really what she talks about is guilt is I did something bad or something bad happened. And that's very different than shame, which is I'm a bad person, right? And I think Brene Brown's work is really helpful because I think our society overall, we struggle with differentiating between guilt and shame. Um, sometimes we think guilt and shame are the same and they're not. Feeling guilty is actually a really good feeling sometimes because if we say, oh my goodness, I made a mistake or oh my goodness, a mistake has been made in the past, then that means we have an opportunity to focus on fixing the mistake, right? And trying to make amends and trying to improve it. So guilt and shame are not created equal, right? And guilt, I think if we sat in our guilt for just long enough, we wouldn't feel so bad anymore because we realize that maybe we have an opportunity to make a difference and to do something with it. So I want to leave that for folks. Um, guilt can be functional. Let's sit with it and let's make some changes as a result. I really like that guilt can be functional. I like that. I really appreciate that insight. Um, Okay, so we're running out of time and I'm really bummed. This is a great discussion, but um, just to wrap up really quick. What are some next steps that we as providers can take to promote change within our respective institutions? Uh, this is for both of you guys, if you have any insight. I wanted to just echo Hoel's, um, and, and I forget the ex exact language you used, but being willing to, to look inward 
um, I think is important, you know, at your own, at your own self, your own actions and motivations, um, you know, and have uh, some of those hard conversations with yourself looking at, you know, why you might be motivated to be acting the, the way that, that you are. Um, on a on a larger level, um, there are there are some processes set up for organizations to to do kind of a, a larger scale um, like self evaluation in terms of of equity or inclusion. Um, if uh, if anybody was interested in any of those, I could point them in the right direction. Uh, if anybody wanted to to contact me. Um, and then I think one one other thing that's that's super practical, and if anybody wants to start thinking about some of these issues, start thinking about how to think about some of these issues, um, the YWCA and Slick put together a really cool, um, I think it's a 21 day challenge. Um, it, it only takes a few minutes a day, and there are. Um, Kind of opportunities to learn about a concept relating to inclusion or bias or equity and then um, an exercise to try to put that into practice whether it's in your own mind you know or or in your work um, so that can be something really easy that that people that want to kind of keep keep learning about some of this stuff can can do and i think for me it comes down to three areas of sort of consciousness or awareness and practices that I have for myself that have helped me throughout the years. Um, the first one is um, understand your fears. Um, it can be really hard. I've been in a lot of situations where I am the only person who cares about equity or racial equity, um, any form of equity. Uh, and that's a very scary place to be. It's very, um, um, it's very disheartening to be the only individual who is willing to speak up about things. Um, simultaneously, we need that because in the moments where I have been brave enough to share my thoughts about something, at least 90% of the time, someone else was concerned as well, but they were just too nervous or too hesitant to want to say something about it. And so leaning into that fear is super important. You know, you don't, sometimes you just have to do things afraid. You don't get to sweep the fear away, right? You just have those conversations and be afraid and be afraid doing them because they matter. The other piece um, that I think is important for promoting change is um, making sure that you have other folks in your organization who are willing to do the difficult work with you. Um, talk to folks about why it's important for the organization as a whole to be more racially equitable or more equitable. Um, find individuals who you can connect with and who are willing to do the work with you. And then build those, you know, collaborations as you see appropriate. And I think the last piece for me as far as creating change as an individual, um, I think what it really comes down to is as often as possible, be more excited about the need for change than you are about keeping things the same. And if you see that things have to change, then just put all of your heart and mind into those needs for change and show people that it is possible to be passionate about change and to want to implement it and to find ways to implement it. And that that is more important than keeping things as they are. And so being able to model that for others is a really great way to have sort of the snowball effect where other people will want to join you in, in that process of doing. Great, I really appreciate those answers. And I appreciate both of you guys being here and talking talking this through, um, a lot of good questions. We have a couple minutes, we have a couple of questions that popped up that folks want some answers and I'm hopeful we can get to a couple of them. Um, one individual asks, when you are dealing with escalated clients, how can you determine if it is a reaction based out of safety or out of bias? Thoughts? Good question. Oh my goodness. Um, I think two things are helpful. Number one, um, for clients that are escalated, the most important thing that you want to do first is de-escalation, right? 
And so I think case managers and anyone who works in direct client services, all of us should be adequately tr trained in de-escalation practices that help a client get back to uh, sort of what I call the calm blue, right? And so first and foremost, de-escalate and allow the safety to be the primary mechanism that drives your decision in that moment, right? Then once de-escalation happens and hopefully the client is better and hopefully you feel safe, then you can go back and sort of ask yourself, okay, you know, what part of that experience made me feel unsafe? Um, and it could be behaviors that the client was demonstrating, you know, because when I was a case manager, there were moments where clients escalated very, very quickly uh, and, you know, physical or verbal violence occurred, right? So use that approach, safety first, and then check your biases after, right? And then that way you can sort of figure out what's going on for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're actually out of time, but I wanted to get that at least one question answered. And I really do appreciate you taking the time to answer that question, Hoel. Um, but yeah, that's what we did. Oh. Thank you guys for attending and for hearing what we have to say. We really appreciate it. And hopefully you guys got something good from this um, and you can go out and have those good discussions. So thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you guys again. Thank you so very much. Just a reminder, we are meeting again tomorrow at starting at 9 a.m. Thank you so much for your time, Maya, Nick, and Joel.